Good afternoon or good evening or good morning, whatever the case might be, as you are at home watching our abbreviated digital midweek Lenten service this week. Again, we'll use the abbreviated format that we did last week. Uh, I will do all of the readings responsively. I'll read the prayers, and you can just sit back and relax and watch. There are no hymns to be sung today. Just enjoy the message from God's word as he gives comfort by his grace. We're continuing our series on the seven words that Jesus spoke, those seven powerful, life-altering phrases that he said hanging from the cross as he was dying. Tonight, we hear his last words as he was literally dying, the last thing that he spoke before he committed his spirit to his Father in heaven. And we find comfort in Jesus' commitment to the mission to rescue us and in him committing his soul to God. We begin our service today with our invocation. We pray. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life, Forgive our sins, speak to our hearts, dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word, and receive our thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As children of God, we confess our many sins. Lord God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive my open sins and my secret sins. Forgive the sins I know and the sins I do not know. Forgive the sins I did to please myself and the sins I did to please others. Forgive them all, gracious Lord, for Jesus' sake. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God now give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. As we continue to review the passion of our Savior that is his suffering, we do so according to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Tonight we pick up where we left off last week. We hear of the sad end of Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples. We hear of his trial before Pilate and his condemnation to be crucified. We continue where we left off last week. Tonight we read Matthew 27, verses 1 through 26. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him led him away and handed him to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled they took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. 
So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called the Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This is the passion of our Lord. We pray. Jesus, all your labor vast, all your woe and conflict past, yielding up your soul at last, hear us, holy Jesus. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is so committed to the cause of rescuing us. Amen. To brothers and sisters in Christ, he should be committed. That phrase can have a lot of different meanings, depending on the context, can't it? He should be committed to his job. He loves what he does, and the pay is so great. He should be committed to the team and spend less time with his girlfriend and more time practicing with us. Or this week, I saw a Facebook post of a guy who said, I was told that if I go grocery shopping and I wear a face mask and rubber gloves, that would be enough. But they lied. Everyone else at the store was wearing clothes. Of course, it's a joke, but can you imagine if someone really did act that way? You would say, that guy is a few cards short of a full deck. That guy is not right in the head. He should be committed to an asylum. Find him a straitjacket. He should be committed to a padded room. Today, we talk about commitment. We should be committed to serving a God who's done nothing but love and serve us. But we're crazy, we're not right in the head, so that we rebel against him to our own harm again and again. And so we should be committed to a cell for all of eternity. But we're not, because Jesus was committed. We see how committed he was to the cause of rescuing us as we watch him hang on the cross and suffer and die to carry out that mission. And once he fulfilled that mission, we hear how he committed his spirit back to the Father again, knowing that everything necessary for our salvation was complete. The next powerful, life-altering phrase that Jesus spoke from the cross is found in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. This is the gospel of our Lord. We should be committed to God, but we're not. And it's crazy how often we rebel against him. A wife ought to be committed to a rich and good-looking husband who's done nothing but love and take care of her. She would be crazy to cheat on him, right? A husband ought to be committed to a rich and wealthy and gorgeous wife who's done nothing but be loving and respectful and kind to him. 
he would be crazy to cheat on her. But don't we act so crazy? Consider what God has done for us. He's humbled himself. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2. And Why did Jesus humble himself in such a lowly and horrible way? Well, you know why. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8. Jesus has done nothing but love us, serve us. He's married himself to us, even though he knew full well he was marrying down and he has made us rich. We should be totally committed to him in return, but we're not. We cheat on him again and again. We're not committed to him. We don't commit our spirits to God in obedience. We don't humble ourselves to serve him by serving others. We don't commit our lives to him. We don't commit our time to him. We don't commit our souls to fearing and loving and trusting in him above all things. We're like a cheating spouse. And it's not just a one-time event. It's habitual. We do it again and again. We're not right in our minds, but we're driven mad by our sinful natures for our lack of commitment. For our crazy infidelity, we ought to be committed, not to a cell, but to hell. Not to the asylum, but to the abyss. But in spite of our lack of commitment to God, we aren't forsaken by him but instead are held by his loving embrace. How? Through Jesus. And through his commitment to carry out the mission to rescue us. There's a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 50 that talks about the coming Messiah and his work. And in a way, it quotes Jesus as saying, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard, I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He set his face like flint. He saw his goal. He saw the mission before him, and he would let nothing move him from it. Nothing could stop him from carrying out his plan, no matter what the cost. So we went to Jerusalem. He went willingly to his death so he could rescue us. He offered his back to be beaten. He offered his face to be mocked and spit on. He willingly endured the torture of crucifixion, the agony of the asylum of hell, separated from God the Father. What committed love he showed to you and to me It's almost crazy. Nevertheless, he was that committed that he would go through hell to rescue us. In the end, even though he was for a time forsaken by the Father, he knew that it would end in a wonderful reunion. And so his dying word was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He knew his work was now complete. You know, that dying word of Jesus, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, is really a quote from Psalm 31. One commentary suggested that Psalm 31 was often used as a Jewish bedtime prayer. When I read that, I immediately thought of the prayer that I so often say with my boys when I'm tucking them into bed, now I lay me down to sleep where we commit our souls to the Lord. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Isn't that in essence what Jesus prayed as his last word on the cross? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
And how fitting it was that Jesus quoted Psalm 31. In this case in particular, here's a little more of that psalm so that you can get the context. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. Because of all of my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors and an object of dread to my closest friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten as though I was dead. I have become like broken pottery. For I hear many whispering terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight, yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Though Jesus was forsaken by God the Father for a time and cut off from him, and that hell that he endured on the cross to win our forgiveness, now with his mission complete, Jesus was rescued. Now, with his mission complete, he could commit his spirit to his Father's loving hands once more. He could pray the Lord his soul to take. And now, with his mission completed, our sins are forgiven. And we won't be committed to the hell that we rightly deserve. And because we're not committed to hell, we can now pray, Now I lay me down to sleep with confidence. In spite of a crashing stock market, in spite of the inability to gather together here in worship, in spite of what might happen with the elections, in spite of a coronavirus scare, and we can commit our souls to him in sleep each night and even in death because that confidence that Jesus displayed on the cross in this word is the same confidence that we display in God in his work completed for us. And so now we too can boldly quote Psalm 31, into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. And we can pray that boldly, confident that he will keep us in his care no matter what we're going through, no matter what enemies pursue us, no matter what happens to the economy, no matter what diseases we might get. Even if we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we have nothing to be afraid of. But can pray with confidence, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And we know that he will. And because we're not committed to the hell that we rightly deserve and can commit our souls to him, just as Jesus was committed to the Father, so too we are now committed to Jesus. One version of now I lay me down to sleep adds this line, if I should live for many days, I pray the Lord to guide my ways. And so we commit our souls to Jesus, trusting in his work, his mission completed for us. But we also commit our lives to him. And thanks for all that he's done. And like a devoted spouse, we long most to do what's pleasing to him. We recommit ourselves to him. We commit our time to him. We commit our energy to him. We commit our gifts and our abilities to his service. We commit our money, not just some of it, but all of it, using it to his glory. We commit our very lives and our very selves to serve his cause. And thanks for the truth that we can commit our souls to his eternal care. And as we do, forget about all state. You're in good hands, in God's hands. And so into his hands, we commit our spirits. Because we know that in all things, he's working for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And should you ever doubt that truth, as you hear the news or read the headlines, you need only to look to the cross again and see how committed he was 
to the cause of rescuing us from being committed to hell. And so we recommit our souls to him. And we recommit our lives to him who gave his life for us. And this I ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. And may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way as you put your trust in him. Amen. Just a reminder that should you want to give your offerings and thanks to our Savior for his commitment to us, you can do so in a number of ways. You can mail your offering in to 627 South Washington Street, New Ulm, Minnesota, 56073. Or it's been suggested that perhaps an easier way would be to use your bank's online bill pay service and have an offering check sent to the same address through that means as well. We continue our service now with the prayer of the church, the Lord's Prayer and our prayer for peace. We pray. Lord Jesus, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. Obeying your Father's will, because you were so committed to saving us, you endured the cross and scorned its shame. Now you sit at the right hand of the throne of God, governing all things for our good. Lord, we confess that it was for us and for our salvation that you came down to this world to suffer and die. You bore our guilt. You endured our punishment. You experienced the wrath of God in our place. For your unselfish sacrifice on our behalf, help us to recommit our lives to you and to show our gratitude to you in everything that we think and say and do. As we walk through this life, keep us from becoming entangled by sin, by worry and doubt. Remove all obstacles and stumbling blocks and keep us from going astray. Help us to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And when that way involves pain, suffering, or persecution, help us to view these things as evidence of your loving discipline intended to draw us ever closer to you. Hear us, Lord, as we also bring you our private petitions in silent prayer. Hold before us the example of those who have gone before, bearing the cross for you. As you led them, so lead us. As you strengthened them, so strengthen us. Keep our eyes fixed on you, for then we shall surely arrive safely at the heavenly home you have prepared for us. Hear us for your mercy's sake. Amen. And hear us as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you again for joining us online, brothers and sisters. We're glad that you could be here today. Just an encouragement that now is a great time to do evangelism and share the link of what you just watched, post it on your own social media pages, and let others hear of the comfort that is ours, knowing our Savior's committed love to us, that we can commit our souls to him. Next week, rather than another service here, and rather than 
the pulpit swap that Pastor Scharf and I had originally intended. We're going to do a link swap instead, so watch for that. We'll send you a link to a service that Pastor Scharf did on one of those powerful life-altering words or phrases that our Savior spoke from the cross. May you go rejoicing, dear brothers and sisters, and may God be with you until we meet again.